Uh, okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the seven-game main slate here we have on May 17. Um, if you are interested in not watching this well after the early slate has posted, I did post a did a, a, a vid for premium subs. Um, that is posted in the Discord. Um, so navigate uh, over to the, the premium MLB channel. Uh, in the Discord, and you'll uh, you'll find the link there for that. Um, nevertheless, this uh, this is the the public um, main slate breakdown. So let's uh, let's get into it here. We have uh, Strider and Garrett Cole on the mound. Once again, they were on the uh, on the same slate in their last outings as well. Uh, Garrett Cole got kind of beat up a little bit by Tam. I don't want to say beat up. He just didn't have his his A plus stuff. Uh, in his back-to-back -back starts against Tampa, uh, and Strider did Strider stuff. So, kind of looking for the same sort of outcomes here tonight. Um, now, I think we can more readily get to some coal tonight for sure. Gets a, a bit of an easier matchup. I mean, every team in baseball is an easier matchup than Tampa. Um yeah, it's really just price tags, right? There's a couple offenses I think that we might want to consider getting to, but um, you know, some of them are, are pretty cheap here, and I think that's why we're seeing such heavy ownership on all the guys up top. It's not just because of the projections, of course, but um, you know, some of these teams like a Cleveland who will get to uh, very cheap and and very playable. Um, but I think there's some kind of off the board stacks a little bit that are, are coming in less popular than somebody like a, a Seattle, Boston, uh, or a Cleveland or something like that. Um, and still cheap enough that will allow us to get to, you know, obviously we want to play Strider, right? Uh, this medium projection, five points higher than everybody else, uh, at least five points higher than Cole. And he's only 500 more expensive. So, uh, early going here, of course, still. So usual disclaimers that um, we'll see ownership numbers and projection figures change throughout the day. <clears throat> but um, you know, in the in the early going here, this uh, this ownership delta really kind of makes sense to me. Uh, Strider, Strider's been fantastic, and Cole is susceptible um, to giving up some baseballs in the air. Strider, really not so much, man. Um, the the fastball is excellent. The slider is excellent, and he's really working in the changeup a little bit more. And, uh, you know, so we'll get into the pitch mix a little bit. But um, I think I'd probably just prefer getting the strider here. He's got a little bit better matchup. Not to say that we can't get to Cole at all. Uh, Toronto is still very attackable. Uh, I played Domingo Herman against them yesterday. It just turns out he was cheating. So Cole, uh, unlikely to be cheating, I would say, after uh, their starting pitcher from yesterday got ejected. So I think we could play this just fine. Uh, it's just a price tag thing, of course, with both of these guys up at the top. Then we have Nathan Eovaldi coming in uh, after three very good starts uh, in succession here. Uh, we'll talk about that. Kodai Senga, I'm still not touching this. We'll talk about that. Down on the lower end, uh, some red numbers, of course, from guys like Josh Fleming, who pitched to a lot of contact in a bad matchup. Marco Gonzalez, who pitched to a lot of contact in a, I mean, kind of a bad matchup, too. Uh, Clevenger gets Cleveland, bad strikeout matchup there. Peyton Batfield doesn't have any strikeout stuff in kind of a subpar strikeout matchup as well. Brian Bayo um, gets Seattle. So some questionable spots down here on the cheaper end. Uh, maybe somebody that's pretty underpriced, I think, in, in a Chris Bassett. So let's, uh, let's just get into it here. Uh, and start with this Yankees-Toronto game. Here's Cole. Like I said, at 11-5, there's nothing wrong in the arsenal or anything. Um, he just had Tampa in back-to-back -back starts, and you're, pretty much every pitcher in baseball is going to struggle. I don't care if you're Cole. I don't care if you're Strider uh, or DeGrom. Or, like, they're all going to struggle against Tampa. It's the best offense in the game, and Cole's not immune. So it's understandable that he got picked apart a little bit. Um so at 11.5, it's it's just the just the price tag that we're gonna have to manage here. Um, I have no problems going after Toronto with very high upside arms, and Cole certainly qualifies there. Uh, he's got fine breaking stuff. Um, can't really take a ton out of the value metrics, of course, just yet in in shorter samples. But 
Um, slider has historically obviously been good. Still, in the even in a short sample, it, getting a lot of value out of the four seamer, of course, um, and out of the changeup and the curveball as well. So I have no problem going after Toronto here, even though traditionally they, you know, don't really strike out a little bit or a, a lot rather. And, and they create against right-handers, but Cole is, of course, a well-above-average right-hander. So um, these offenses mostly just average. Yankees are, too, in pretty much every metric. They'll hit for a little bit more power and some hard contact, mostly just coming from Judge, though, um, and Rizzo, I suppose. So I think Chris Bassett on the other side is also very playable. I think he's underpriced relative to his upside. Now, I generally don't like playing guys when they just come off a complete game shutout <laughs> or, or something like that. And we'll get to Eovaldi. He's done three games in a row. Um, Bassett is really not that kind of guy. Uh, he has kind of figured it out a little bit. However, like I said, he's underpriced relative to, I think, the upside that he offers in this particular spot. Um, average offense over here. And Bassett, I think, is still at a slightly above average arm despite the fact that the K stuff has really dropped off over the last couple of seasons. Now, this isn't really like early season noise or anything. Uh, he was really kind of poor last year as well. It was really when he was with the Mets at 23, 24% strikeout rate. Um, and I guess coming over from Oakland where he, he excelled in, in that area. It's dropped off, definitely, and he's more of a pitcher anymore, but throwing six pitches here and... That makes it difficult for opposing lineups to navigate, even if you're not getting a lot of value, right, out of any one of the pitches. Um, he's still establishing very well here with the sinker slider combo, and that's keeping him down in the strike zone uh, a little bit more. The with such good plus value here in in the early going, at least uh, on this slider, this cutter will be better. Um, very similar pitch grips, just not going to break as much as the, a raw slider here. So this will be better, and the changeup should also be a little bit better than the realized value so far. He struggled in his first, whatever, five, six starts um, to really kind of get going, and it seems like he's kind of really putting it all together here. He's had, uh, I guess in his last matchup when he threw the complete game shutout, he got Atlanta. That's a very good offense over there. Went the full nine and struck out eight. Um, so the K stuff is, is probably still going to be a little bit underwhelming overall. However, that's kind of priced in here at 7,400. And I think we can still attack a little bit of the Yankees because, as we mentioned, just an average run creation offense so far. Getting healthier and et cetera, et cetera, as we talked about for the last week or so. You could play Judge. He's gotten a price drop down to 6,000 after hitting three jacks in two days. Uh, you can play Rizzo as well, 4,600. That's probably where it ends for me for the most part. I don't really want to play Glaber here or DJ necessarily. If you need to make it a little bit cheaper and stomach the judge price, you can play Jake Bowers. He's still 2,000. Uh, but I'm kind of off of a Harrison Bader, Volpe type play today from the Yankees, and I think I'd rather just play some Chris Bassett. I like the ownership here at this particular price tag, uh, and I think he's a pretty high upside um, pretty high upside play for this price. Now, is he going to pop for 25 plus and 30 plus all that regularly? Well, uh, no. I mean, that's what the median 15 point uh, projection implies, right? But I, I think this is a, a playable spot for him to outperform this particular price tag. And it looks like, like I said, he's he's getting it going a little bit. Uh, even though I don't like playing guys after uh, outsized performances like that, um, I think the price tag is kind of uh, forcing my hand here a little bit. So I'll have um, yeah, a pretty decent bit of Chris Bassett, I think. And, of course, some Cole. Uh, I'm not playing any Toronto here. I don't care who it is. I just don't stack guys against Cole, usually, unless it's a super high leverage spot. Um yeah, and I don't really think this qualifies. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on Vladdy. He came out of the game last night. He's probably going to get a day off, and he's like their best contact hitter. So um, maybe a guy or two starting to heat up a little bit. Bo Bichette having cooled off a lot since his early season barrage. Maybe figuring it out and, and popping out of this little cold spell he's been in. Same thing with George Springer. 
Um, but everybody else been pretty cold outside of Whit Merrifield, who is just – he's like Ricky Henderson over here. Um, so I'm not super interested in playing any of the Blue Jays, mostly just pitching here for me. It may be like a short stack of the Yankees, Judge, Rizzo, Bauer, or something like that. Okay, let's move on. Tampa and the Mets. Uh, Josh Fleming going to come in here and spot start for I, – I call it a spot start for the Rays – um, he started a couple of games, I guess just one. He's been mostly coming out of the bullpen because he pitches to so much contact. He just doesn't have any strikeout stuff, and this is why they had to move him to the bullpen. 84% full contact rate, and this is not a recipe that we want to be messing with when going after the Mets. This is a high-contact offense, and that's how they're really built. Don't strike out a lot. Don't hit for a lot of power, uh, but maybe a, a guy or two, in particular a Pete Alonzo, 5,400, he hit a ball out yesterday, hopefully starting to see the baseball a little bit better. Frankie Lindor, still expensive at 49, Nimmo 47, expensive for him too. But the guys down at the bottom half of the lineup, very playable uh, and very attainable price-wise. Jeff McNeil, just a contact hitter, but it hits lefties okay, 3,900 for him. Josh Fleming is probably only going to go about four uh, four innings here. Um for the uh, for the Rays, unless he's really rolling, and I don't necessarily project that. Uh, it might be hard for the Mets to get there because they're still going to see a little bit of a bullpen game here from Tampa. So we generally don't like doing that and stacking teams in bullpen games. But I think it's an okay spot to get to some of the Mets here. Maybe some short stacks because Fleming pitches to so much contact. He's just not going to throw by these guys, and they're not going to strike out as we showed a 20% aggregate K rate. Um, hard to get there though with full Met stacks in general, but this is a seven game slate. It's pretty short here. And I think we can consider getting to, to some of them and targeting some Fleming. Could I sang on the mound? I'm still not doing, dealing with this. Uh, now he did only walk one batter in his last outing, but I don't care. <laughs> uh, he had six outings before that where he walked at least four guys in pretty much every single one. So uh, I'm not dealing with it. He has no chase in him, despite the fact that he's getting some whiffs on the splitter um, or this ghost fork, whatever they call it. Uh, I'm, I'm not dealing with this. Uh, the, the walk rate is too high, and he elevates his own pitch count, and the price tag's still too high. So no thank you uh, against Tampa. I'm not. We saw what they did to Verlander yesterday, and I'd be much more apt to play Verlander than, uh, against Tampa, or Garrett Cole against Tampa, for example, uh, than a guy that's walking 15% of his of the hitters he faces. It's just not happening. So uh, way too expensive for me. Um, I know the strikeout stuff is there, but this is Tampa, and they're only striking out at a 22% clip in aggregate against righties, and they're walking a little bit here at a 9% clip. It's not super high, but uh, 9% for an aggregate team rate is, is a pretty notable number. They're going to hit the baseball in the air and make a boatload of hard contact here. 36% in aggregate at 137 WRC+. Plus. So much power. They can get there against every single arm in baseball, and especially when you start putting guys on base for free. I am not going anywhere near this. Uh, hopefully he makes me look like an idiot sometime soon because I'd really like this arm to be good, but I cannot touch this at this price given this walk rate. There's just way too much variance for a guy that's only going to go five, five and a third because he's walked everybody. No, thank you. Uh, so give me some Tampa in that in that respect. I think you can play all these guys. They're at a little bit more playable price tags than they have been recently, um, but they still got cheap guys down at the bottom of the lineup that you could play. Luke Rayleigh, Josie Siri. Uh, Turned into Ted Williams last night somehow. Stole the base, too. Uh, Frankie Mejia behind the plate. He's playable at 3,000. Taylor Walls has a little bit of pop from the left side this season, at least. Um, he's 3,800. You could play him. Josh Lowe, still expensive at 49, as is Randy at 56. And Brandon Lau at 47. Wander, 58. So you got to pay for those guys. But they're going to kind of anchor your stack here. And if you want to get to full five-man raise or just four-man raise, something like that, I think this is a very playable construction here, targeting a very high variance walk rate in Kodai Senga. So no pitching on the mound here for me, uh, just offense, mostly Tampa. Uh, but you can get to some Mets as well. I, I do like a Pete Alonzo at 5,400. I think it's a pretty decent spot here. Um, outside of that, price-wise, not super thrilled, but uh, Fleming's going to pitch to a ton of contact here, so you could play pretty much anybody on the Mets. 
Okay, Seattle and the Red Sox. Marco and uh, Brian Bayo on the mound. Um, Marco pitches to too much contact himself, and I don't think we can do this. He just doesn't have the, the raw K stuff. Now, I love watching this guy pitch. He's got a fantastic changeup um, and a pretty damn good curveball himself. It's just that he doesn't throw it past anybody, so it makes him very hard to play in DFS. Um but I, I love Marco. He, I've really got a soft spot for him. Not because he made me a ton of money in DFS or anything. It's just I, I love watching this kid pitch. Um, it's kind of difficult, though, when he pitches to so much contact and he gets beat up a little. And I think Boston might be able to get to him a little bit tonight. They got some high contact hitters here. Justin Turner, Rob Refsnyder hit lefties very well. Um, Turner doesn't strike out against anybody. Devers is Devers. Yoshida doesn't strike out either against either side. Um, and nor does Verdugo, really. So a lot of high contact hitters here. Kike will strike out maybe a little bit more, but Marco's not going to do that to him. So um, you can play a guy down at the bottom of the lineup like a Connor Wong as well. Don't forget about him. Cheap catcher piece behind the plate at 2,700. He's had shown a lot of pop this year, as a matter of fact. So you can get to some Boston stacks here. They're probably going to pop in ownership right behind Cleveland and Seattle, who we'll talk about here in a sec. Um, and you can play pretty much all of them. I, th I think it's fine to go after some Marco. However, we got to note that it is only 50 degrees in Boston tonight. Uh, so it's going to play a little less hitter-friendly than it has in the last couple of days. Um, but you can still get there because there's going to be a lot of contact. Same thing with Brian Bayo on the other map. Uh, on the same mound on the other side, 5,700 for Bayo. Now, there's maybe a little bit of upside at this price tag for him. In this particular matchup, I don't know. Um, he just doesn't have the K stuff. He sacrificed a lot of the high K upside in order to throw more strikes. That's really been Bayo's problem. Ever since they tried the, the, the Brian Bayo experiment, starting, what, last year, maybe the year before, um, he just wasn't able to throw strikes. He had a 15% walk rate. He couldn't find the strike zone at all. And all of a sudden, he, he's fixed everything. And then look at that. It keeps him in the big leagues. Who'd have thought? 66, 67% strike, one rate, and 105 hitters so far. Like, that's a huge number. This is elite. He he was at like 54% previously. So he's really figured that out. The walk rate has tanked. And this is very encouraging for Bayo. But as I said, it's at the expense of the swing and miss still throwing the sinker slider changeup mix down in the strike zone and that gives him a lot of ground balls which makes him serviceable which suggests that he could pop for a little bit more than this price tag suggests at 5700 uh lo pretty low ownership here because seattle is going to be very heavily stacked probably the most popular team at least they are in the early runs here um heating up a little bit definitely 98 WRC plus average in all these metrics, of course, but a little elevated in the hard contact, well below average in the strikeout rate. So Bayo's not going to strike him out, of course, um, but that does increase their variance. Do you want to fade Seattle? Probably not because Bayo's still going to pitch to a good bit of contact here because he's throwing so many strikes now. Um, and with a changeup, he'll be able to neutralize some of these lefties like a Jared Kelnick and a Cal Raleigh or something. But with a two-seamer, marginal two-seamer, uh, you can still play some of those lefties because they're still going to see it quite a bit. He'll throw the four-seamer a little bit more to the, to the left side and try and stay off of the sinker a little bit. But uh, he's still going to have to throw it to him because with the fastball mix, that's a full 58% of the arsenal nearly. So, um, you know, good four-pitch mix for him here. And like I said, throwing a lot more strikes. Getting bludgeoned here with the slider here so far. And that's why he's given up so much power. So I probably prefer to stay off of some of the righties. If I'm going to try and get contrarian with some Seattle stacks, play some of these right-handers that are very cheap, like a Ty France. Julio's not going to be contrarian, but he's 5,300. Um, Ty France, 38. You could play that for sure. If you want to play Gino, I mean, I don't really but uh he's 4300 you could play him and tay oscar hopefully starting to heat up a little bit had i believe a two rbi triple or an rbi triple or something last night um and was on base a couple of times so taylor Trammell hit a bomb as as well last night he'll hit fine from the left side really be able to lift the baseball which is what you want to see when you get a, you've got a high ground ball rate guy like a brian bayo to the left side um now, once again, he's got a good changeup, so I'm not super crazy about playing a lot of the lefties here. Kelnick, after his uh, 
over five last night. Got a price bump to 4,800. Still a fine spot. He's still a fine hitter. Um, but might be cooling down a little bit. And the risk is is kind of, you know, priced. It, or we're getting priced out, I should say, um, with Kelnick now. So J.P. Crawford had a, a rough night last night as well. He's still playable at 3,200. So you can make this happen with a couple of these lefties. I'd probably prefer to get to some of the righties, though. 313 average allowed because he's pitching to so much contact. 409 Woba and a 312 ISO to the right side with some strikeouts there, but so much hard contact here. I think we're going to be able to get to Seattle a good bit, and we're going to probably have to get contrarian because Bayo's just going to he's going to put it on the barrel here to him. So 202 X ISO to both sides is a very notable number. Um, realized 2-0 homer per nine. Short sample, yeah, just five starts and and 23 innings here. But I think uh, the hard contact rate is really going to persist uh, a bit more for Brian Bayo as he throws more strikes. So um, offense really only here for me in the in the Seattle Boston game. But notable that if you want to get off, it is only 55 degrees in Boston and it plays much more pitcher friendly when the weather is cool. Okay, Milwaukee and St. Louis. Um, Ay ay ay. Corbin Burns here. I think he's also underpriced, similar to Chris Bassett, right? I think Chris Bassett's probably more underpriced relative to where he should be than Corbin Burns is. Like, I don't think Corbin Burns is a 10 5 arm anymore. Uh, and that's because he's only got a 21% aggregate K rate anymore. And the walk rate is kind of ballooning. Now, yeah, we do have a shortish sample here. Um,. But 45 and two-thirds, 45 and two-thirds, and that's how this is trending. Strike rate is, is fine, but the chase is not. And the swinging strikes and, and called strikes, CSW is all there, so he's underpriced due to those couple of metrics. But the raw whiff stuff and the chase are really what's leaving it on the table for him. And that's why I don't think he's as underpriced as maybe a Chris Bassett. Uh, I think Bassett's maybe got a little bit more in the arsenal to maneuver with here. Not that Corbin Burns doesn't. I think they're very close. Uh, and if I had to choose, I'd probably just play Bassett. Um, he's coming in at lower ownership, number one. And he doesn't have to face the freaking Cardinals, who are putting up 84 runs every day. Uh, I'm not going near this offense. I'm just not doing it with a lower strikeout arm and Corbin Burns. That's not to say that he can't pick through this team here, but I'm, I'm not doing it when they're this this hot. It's every single one of them, and it's every night. They're all seeing the baseball, and as we're seeing, the run creation is starting to creep up here, power along with the hard contact, and the K rate is dropping. So um, they've all hit for average against both sides all season. Uh, I'm, not, I'm just not doing it at, at uh, with uh, pretty much anybody at the, at the moment uh, while the offense is this hot. Um, so I'm not interested at all really in Corbin Burns. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like he's underpriced. So I'm probably going to have to have some and probably going to end up landing on some because the projection will, I think, dictate that. But man, I, I I'm really gulping here. I don't want to play pitchers against the Cardinals right now. Um, I mean, Aaron Otto is just, he is Ted Williams, you know, like, um, Goldschmidt is Goldschmidt. Lars is at a very playable 4,000 here. Nolan Gorman, 4,100. Uh, Wilson Contreras got a price drop to 38. You can play Donovan to 33. Now we're talking with Brandon Donovan um, at that price tag. You can play Burleson down at the bottom of the lineup. You can play Tommy Edmond. He's hitting for both sides now. Uh, so, like, I, I think it's a very difficult spot for Corbin Burns here tonight. This median projection Almost looks a little bit high, and I think the ownership is probably a, a little too high, despite being underpriced given the underlying uh, swinging strike metrics. Um, but I'd, I'm just not doing it. If it makes me look stupid, it makes me look stupid. But um, does that mean I want to stack against him? Eh, probably not. But, I mean, this is a very hot offense, and we've seen you, you just don't want to fade hot offenses, and and this is why, like, hot streaks exist, right? Uh, and anybody that tells you otherwise is... Um, is lying to you. In any case, uh, very difficult spot for Corbin Burns. I'll certainly come in under this ownership figure. Um, if it's zero for me, I'm not sure, but uh, it's going to be difficult, I think, for me to get to this. Uh, Matt Liebertor is making his first start for the Cardinals um, today against the Brewers. Now, I don't think he's underpriced. Um, I think he's way overpriced, to be quite honest. Uh, his numbers last year, he made, I think, Let's let's see. Six starts, seven starts, 
uh, for the Cards last season. And in the bigs, when he when he debuted, um, let's see, it was, yeah, it was a full seven starts and nine appearances, just 34 and two-thirds, so a pretty short sample. But he got he got picked apart pretty good, 6 ERA with a 5-0 XFIP. Um, and a 5-0 Sierra. So he, he gave up a lot of contact, buck 73 whip, pretty high numbers there. Just an 8% swinging strike rate with a 53% strike one rate, right? So very vulnerable in being able to throw strikes, get ahead of hitters, and not a lot of whip stuff from him either. So he's got four pitches here, fastball, uh, slider, curveball, change. But really it's just the the fastball and the curveball that are, are plus pitches for him. Slider's okay. Changeup really not very good. So that's going to make him very susceptible to a lot of the righties over here from Corbin Burns and, uh, excuse me, from the Brewers. And I think they're maybe starting to heat up a little bit. Uh, like, don't get me wrong. They're still striking out a crap load. Um, but they got to Jordan Montgomery a little bit last night. Or a couple of the guys did, like an Owen Miller Willie Adamas or something. You played these guys. Miller's 2,400. Willie Contreras, 37. Willie Adamas, 4,000 now. He's not 5, 6K like he was earlier in the season. Uh, I think this is very reasonable to get to some short Brewer stacks here. I'm lo- I'm still looking for them to bounce a little bit. Yeah, they're going to strike out, but I'm looking for the hard contact number to start to persist through and them to start to lift lift the baseball a little bit. Uh, these are better hitters historically against right-handed pit, or excuse me, against left-handed pitching than they have displayed so far this season. Um, in aggregate, they're still going to whiff. Yelich going to strike out. Mikey Brousseau going to strike out. Um, we have Willie Adamas going to strike out a little bit. You know, these guys will swing and miss. Tyrone Taylor, Joey Weimer, young hitters down here at the bottom of the lineup that are still going to whiff. Um, so don't get me wrong, but Matt Liebertor is not going to throw it past them. He has, let's see, last season in the upper minors, uh, or excuse me, in the, in the bigs, just a 9% barrel rate, but a 17% strikeout rate with an 11% walk rate, 36% hard contact, um, and that projects to persist through into this season as well. Hasn't really... Um, made any significant changes in the arsenal that I can see. Uh, so just a spot start for him, um, trying to search for something here out of their starting pitching staff uh, are, the, are the Cardinals here. But I'd, I'd rather get to some Brewers here. I think this is a pretty decent spot, a very attainable price tag. This is one of the cheap teams that's going to allow you to get up to a Strider um, on the mound, or, or Cole, if you want to go there. So, really just the Brewers here for me. Very little Corbin Burns, though. I, I do like some Cardinals. I don't want to stack against Burns because I respect the, the arm. Um, but, man, it's a very hot offense. And if you want to get some pieces of the Cardinals in short stacks, I think that's okay. All right, Atlanta and Texas. Uh, Strider on the mound at 12000 It's just the price tag. that you know I got no problems going after Texas here with, with Strider. Uh, they're going to strike out. And even though I like playing Texas a lot, they're an underrated lineup, really. And they may very well get their best hitter in Corey Seager back tonight. Uh, but if he's got, like, I don't know, just bubble guts or whatever he's, he's got going on, they may very well just sit him today because he gets Strider. You know, this is not a good matchup. Uh, as I mentioned, four-seamer is excellent, slider is excellent, and he's throwing the change up a little bit more. So he's getting more confidence in this pitch. As soon as he starts to really believe in it, uh, I mean... He sh- he'll be 14,000 next season uh, when he starts throwing this change up more than 10% of the time. It'll make him completely unhittable. And I'm going to say this pretty much every start for him. So, it, like, the arsenal is excellent. He's got a 43% strike or raw K rate with a 20% swinging strike rate this season. It is astronomical. Um, the value that he brings in terms of DFS. And that's really what we're after. He'll give up three runs sometimes, maybe. We don't really care because he's going to strike out 12 guys. So give me all of this, the strider, and it's going to be very hard at this projection relative to everybody else, even to Cole, and even with his price tag, for me to not get 100%. I, I just don't see it happening. It's super difficult unless you manually cap the ownership that you come in with him. Um, it's just too high. And the, the upside is just too high. He has 40-point upside every single time he takes them out. Um, Nathan Eovaldi, evidently he does too. Uh, he's had three very good starts in succession, as I mentioned. Um, 
This is really not who Nathan Eovaldi is, however. Uh, he gives up a lot of power. It hasn't really done so this year, and obviously in, the, in his last three starts, he's gone 9, 8, and 8 and 2 thirds innings with 8Ks, 5Ks, 12Ks. Uh, so very encouraging from Nathan Eovaldi. I don't think this is who he is, however. He's still not really changed much in the arsenal. The usage is the same. He's just getting more value out of the four-seamer and getting more value out of the split. Curveball value is relatively static year over year. Cutter value, static. Slider value, static. I mean, static, it, it's still a bad pitch. Still doesn't eke out a lot of value, but losing 10 outs to the field on a 4% usage pitch is, you know, not good. Um, that said... He's just eking a ton more value out of the slide or the, the splitter so far and a, a lot more value out of the four-seamer. So that's what's allowed him to establish early in counts. 65% strike one rate, huge chase with all of the split value. CSW north of 30%, pushing 31 here. All of this is great. This is the results, and it, they've been fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Um, but as I mentioned with Bassett, I, I don't like playing guys when they've had outsized performances to their historical averages. And Evaldi's now done it three times in a row. Like, the guy does not average eight innings every single start. And he's done it in each of his last three. So I'm looking to fade that type of stuff. And he's coming in with not as much ownership as I kind of hoped, uh, but kind of makes sense here, just 15 16%. It's fine to get some exposure to him because Atlanta's still going to strike out. And he's been very, very good. But... This is one of the best offenses in baseball, um, and despite the fact that they haven't really created just yet against right-handed pitching, similar to the Cardinals, they're gonna like these numbers are gonna come up because they make a lot of hard contact and hit for a good bit of power and walk a lot, so they're gonna make it more and more difficult on opposing starters, and this run creation number is going to come up, um, dissimilar to the or I guess. Contrary to the Cardinals, they don't hit for near as much average. 3% is 3% in a team aggregate, and that's a big number. And they strike out 3% more. So uh, that's really the main delta there. But they hit for just as much hard contact and get to baseball in the air just as often, hit for just as much power. So uh, very similar offense to the Cardinals against uh, righties are the Braves. And I like taking some some short shots on outsized pitcher performances. We'll get to another guy in the next game that I'm also going to likely um, continue to take shots against. So Eovaldi qualifies in that regard for me. Like he's just not an, an average 36 or 37 point um, the DK point pitcher in every out. He's just not. So um, pretty outsized performances to fight. Like, don't get me wrong. Everything has been great and it's been very good to see all of the whiff stuff really finally show up, but he still gives up power historically, doesn't induce enough soft contact for me, and shorting those those results is, uh, I think, an okay approach. Um, I think he's overpriced for where he is, where he should be historically. He's not overpriced for the results, but, you know, earlier in the season, he struggled against Kansas City twice. Uh, he struggled against Cincinnati. He struggled against the Cubs. You know, they were hot at the beginning of the year, whatever. Um, and, and Philly, those are roughly 15-point outings in each one of those. And all of a sudden, he gets the Yankees in a plus matchup, Oakland in a very plus matchup, and L.A. in an okay matchup. Um, and, he, and he really excels. So I think, yeah, we may be seeing a little bit of noise come through, definitely in this price tag. I think it's too high. And he may, may make me look stupid, uh, but I think I'm going to be playing Atlanta here. Nobody's going to be playing them. And that's how we want to get to the Braves because they have all the power in the world and they can win, win you a slate by hitting four or five bombs and they can do it uh, against everybody in baseball. So uh, give me Atlanta pretty much exclusively here. I don't want anything to do with Texas um, or Eovaldi, really. Okay, Cubs and Houston. Here's the other guy I kind of want to continue to short. 7,600 for Drew Smiley. He's not 9,100 anymore, which is good. Um He's back near where I think there's a little bit of upside at the price for him in general. However, this is a horrific matchup for him against the Astros. I'm not going near him on the mound. Um, really only a two-pitch guy with a little bit of the cutter. It's been good value for him, but he's throwing a hell of a lot of a sinker here and really not getting ground balls. He's a fly ball pitcher with a two-seamer, and when you float the two-seamer, the ball's going to go over the wall, and we're not going to be 
dealing with that against the Astros. They strike out at a 15% aggregate clip against left-handers. Similar to all these other teams that just don't strike out, their hard contact numbers uh, and run creation are going to continue to come up as the weather gets warmer and they get some more of their guys healthier here. Uh, Mo DeBone, 3,300 is fine. He doesn't strike out. Alex Bregman, 4,200. I like. I'm starting to like this a lot. Getting into sort of price enforcement territory uh, with him. He didn't strike out either. Jordan, of course, you can play him against everybody. 57, that's fine. Kyle Tucker, 51, also fine. Uh, Josie Abreu, 2,500, not fine. I mean, price tag's fine. Uh, the fundamentals are not fine, but yeah, you can play him. 47 for Pena, still stiff, but a Chaz McCormick or a Corey Jolks down at the bottom of the line, if they can make it a little bit cheaper for you, they're not going to strike out all that much against left-handed pitching either. Um, nor will Martin Maldonado, who really doesn't have a whole lot of upside, but, um, you know, he's 2,200. He's catcher piece. If you're stacking Houston here, and I think that's pretty warranted, uh, you can play pretty much every one of these dudes. And I think that's a fine approach. Uh, they're coming in kind of down the list a little bit, maybe fourth or fifth in ownership so far of the 14 teams on the day. So I think there's a good bit of value targeting some Drew Smiley. I'm not going near him. Uh, so much rather just play Bassett. Um, JP France on the mound for the Astros. I, yeah, I really want to play this guy, man, but I, I don't think I can do it here at 79. Maybe I'll land on some and some correlated teams or something. Um, but I think the price tag is generally a bit too high. Now he does have five pitches that he's throwing. So that's good. Short sample here, so we can't take anything out of the value in just 44 hitters that he's seen in his two starts. But we can take, as is usual, value out of the, the, the strike one rate, and it's 52%. So that at this particular price tag, if he's going to struggle getting ahead of hitters and, and get behind in roughly half of them, I mean, that, that makes it very difficult to play in DFS in particular. It's just it, it spikes the variance for his walk rate. I know it hasn't quite translated yet. But well, we're talking a super short sample here. And if this persists, there's no way that a 5% walk rate will persist. There's just no chance. Because the chase rate at the moment is also very low. So something is really off here. And we're dealing with a lot of early season short sample noise. So I'd like to capitalize on that usually. Excuse me. And play some guys that um, I'm, I'm seeing some, some variance in the numbers with. However, the price tag really makes it kind of difficult. And honestly, on the other side, I'd like to get to some of the Cubs if I can. The price tags over here make this a, another team that you, you can consider as short stacks or even full stacks, targeting a young arm here um, because they're very, very cheap. Madrigal at the top of the line, if he's 2,200 with dual eligibility, he's going to pop very hard in value metrics. Uh, Dansby, 44, got a price bump today, but still 44 playable price for him. Chris Morell at 41 still. Happ at 42. A little bit up from yesterday, I believe. Say Suzuki's hit another bomb. He's 3,600. Starting to get into territory where he's going to heat up. So don't forget about him. He's 36. Uh, that's a very good price. He was 5K at the beginning of the year. Um, Matt Mervis hit his first bomb, I believe, last night. He's a very playable first base piece at 2,300. You're probably going to stay off of the Eric Hosmer shenanigans that they're going to pull um, over here. But I think this is fine to get to some of the Cubs. Um, they have very playable pieces. We'll see what Cody Bellinger, he's dealing with a leg or a knee or something like that, sore knee, I think. Um, so we'll see if if he's back in the lineup tonight. Uh, I would play him as well. Not sure if his price tag off the top of my head, but... Um, yeah, we'll see, and I think the Cubs are a very playable piece here, as is J.P. France. Now, don't get me wrong, we're still a, 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 against a lineup that's been pretty cold over the last couple of weeks, or at least cooled off pretty significantly. I think it's fine to play them at cheap price tags in a high-variant spot, where I think there's going to be some regression in some of these numbers somewhere. It's either going to be in the walk rate because of the, the strike one rate, uh, or it's going to be in the chase rate, in which case you could play J.P. JP France. Uh, or somewhere around here, right? We'll see how this has to flesh out. I I think ch playing some JP is okay because he's got the five-pitch mix. Um, not wild about the price, of course, but I think the ownership is fine, and playing a lot of Houston is probably going to get a good bit of run support. At least I'm counting on that. So um, there's value in that. That said, I, I like a very cheap offense that's going to allow me to get to Strider and... 
um, and another high upside offense, maybe like in Atlanta, something like that. So I think it's uh, pretty viable to play all sides of this game outside of Drew Smiley. No thank you for me. Okay, Cleveland and the White Sox last game here. Peyton Battenfield, I don't think I'm going to be able to play this guy as well, or either, rather. Um, just 20% aggregate K rate. I want to get to the White Sox, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, you can laugh at me here in a sec when we go over that. 6K for Battenfield. He's had one good start, really, this season, and that was against the Twins where he went uh, seven innings, I believe. He had a, he was perfect going into the sixth or the seventh inning. Um Outside of that, though, he's been pretty underwhelming. His first couple of appearances were pretty decent. Didn't go all that long. Just four and two-thirds in his first start. Struck out just three against the Yankees. Then he went six against Detroit, but uh, I could go six against Detroit. Um, And then got picked apart by Colorado and Boston. And once again, by Detroit in his last outing. So um, immediately following that really plus outing against Minnesota, he got Detroit and he gave up four runs, right? So... Um, that's why I like sort of counter trading momentum a little bit, uh, for guys, um, after they're coming off a a really good start, uh, guys like Drew Smiley have, have done that a couple of times, uh, Nathan Yavaldi, of course, and Chris Bassett as well. Um, so I'm going to probably continue to do this with Battenfield. I don't think he's got anywhere near, uh, six and seven inning upside here in this particular spot. I think we're talking more in the five um, range. Now, he, he's going to throw some strikes. Not going to walk a lot of people necessarily, but look at this barrel rate, man, 13.5%. It's a short sample, yes, but this is one of the numbers in terms of raw contact that's going to converge pretty quickly here. And north of 50% hard contact. Is this going to persist? I mean, no, it's probably going to come down, right? Or Either that or he's going to get sent down. Uh, one of the two. Low average to the lefties here, 305 Woba, but a 306 ISO, like right on the freaking barrel. So probably noisy in that regard, but it's really due to lack of a changeup. He doesn't have a change. He's only four-seamer cutter curveball. And unfortunately, you need some sort of off-speed and whiff pitch against opposite-handed hitters. Otherwise, you're just going to get beat to shreds. And that's really what we're seeing with bat and field here. So, um... That's the lefties, and that's the all Moncada territory. You can play some Gavin Sheets. That I, I like that a lot, 2,500. Uh, you can play Andrew Benintendi, 3,000 flat in the two-hole. We're starting to get into territory where uh, he's a very attractive play here. Um, Tim Anderson, you can play every day, 4,800. That's fine. Luis Robert, 38, is a very good price for him as well. Andrew Vaughn's playable. Um, Jake Berger's playable. You can play pretty much everybody. Really, the only guys I don't want to play are like uh, Yasmani Grandal behind the plate. Or uh, Hans or Alberto or whatever they do at the bottom of the lineup. Um, so pretty much everybody else I think is well in play here. And they're not going to be near as popular as Cleveland on the other side, who you can also play. So I think I'd prefer to be getting to some of the White Sox here. Um, they're a very attainable price-wise. They're, they're still going to allow you to get to Strider. Mike Clevenger on the mound for the Sox, 6,500. I'm not playing him either. Um, he doesn't have any strikeout stuff anymore. Now, we, we did see yesterday that Lance Lynn picked apart the Guardians because they're missing their best hitter um, in Josie Ramirez. But Mike Clevenger does not have the same type of upside whiff stuff that Lance Lynn does. So he's having trouble throwing strikes, and Lance Lynn is not. He was throwing 70-plus percent strike one. So he's throwing it right over the middle of the damn plate. Clevenger is going to have a little bit more trouble there. He's going to walk some more people, and he's not going to strike out nearly as many guys. Now, is is the production against uh, or to the left side of the plate probably going to regress a little bit? Yeah, I would say so, but probably not to the same degree that it was likely to regress for Lance Lynn yesterday, if that makes sense. Um, Lance Lynn had been horrible, and he was probably a bit underpriced in hindsight. I, I still didn't touch him. Don't get me wrong. I didn't play any of him. Um, but Mike Clevenger is probably not as underpriced as Lance Lynn was yesterday. So similar to the kind of Chris Bassett and Corbin Burns dynamic that we got today, I, I think Clevenger is less underpriced than he he probably um, – you know, is he underpriced? Yeah, maybe. He should be like 7,200 or something like that in general for this type of arsenal, I think. Um, you know, what, four pitches here? Mostly four-seamer slider guy, but he mixes in the curveball cutter change. Um, should he be in the 7Ks? Yeah, probably. Could he squeeze out 18, 20 points against Cleveland? Yeah, since they're missing their best hitter and this offense is dreadful. 
They are so bad, man. 108 ISO, 25% hard contact rate, 78 WRC+. plus. Yeah, they don't strike out, but now that they're missing Josie Ramirez uh, for the next couple of days, um, is that attackable with a below-average arm? Yeah, probably. If you land on a couple of Mike Clevenger teams, am I going to just humiliate you? Uh, I mean, no. Uh, like, am I going to go out of my way to do this? Also, no. Um so I would like to get to a couple of Cleveland pieces. I think they're playable, like a, in particular an Andres Jimenez. Himmy will probably be in the in the four hole, I would guess, today, or the three or the four hole, something like that, because they also lost Josh Naylor last night. So um, he'll probably get a day off. It's unfortunately Josh Bell who you're going to have to play in stacks at first base, which kind of stinks. Um, but he's okay from the left side. It is his better side. Steven Kwan at the top is still fine, 4,400. Med Rosario not jacked about that but um you know you can play him in stacks uh will brennan is probably where i'd i'd like to go in the outfield instead of like a gabby arias or um you know maybe a, a brian rocchio they, they just called him up yeah he's a high upside prospect he's a stone min you play him at like a shortstop if you need to get there so plenty of value as we've discussed all day from some of these cleveland bats that's really what's making their ownership number pop so hard in the early going here because it's certainly not because of, you know, equity uh, or anything like that. Um, now, Clevenger is going to give it up, yeah, but, uh, I mean, this team is terrible. So can you play Clev? Sure. Uh, I'm not going to go out of my way because I'm really not, like, all that intrigued with a 19% K rate against a team that strikes out at 19 20% clip. Um, you know, walks and, and barrels and, like, I'd, it's just not attractive to me. So um, probably mostly going to get to offense here. Very little pitching. It would be maybe some Clev. I don't think I'm going to go near Battenfield at all. Uh, but I like I like some White Sox here. They're a little bit uh, down the down the board in terms of ownership so far. And I think we can play that. So, so that's it for the breakdown. Um, let's quickly go over stacks here. I like pitching pretty much exclusively in this game. I'm not going to go out of my way to target these guys. Uh, offense only, I think, in the in the Mets game. I want Tampa for sure against Kodai Senga, especially if he's going to get any ownership. Uh, 18, 20%, like no thank you with a 15% walk rate. I'm, I'm out. Um, probably offense only here as well. Now, uh, Marco at 71, I just don't think he can play. He's just super difficult to get there with in DFS at 71. Yeah, not great. Uh, Brian Bayo, he's a bit more underpriced at 57, but he pitches to probably too much contact anymore uh, against this particular team over here in Seattle. I, I think we just get to offense here in this game, but only 50 degrees in Boston. Milwaukee, give me some of them, and definitely give me some some St. Louis again. I don't care who they're playing right now. Uh, even Corbin Burns, who I don't like stacking against generally, uh, and usually with more lefty-heavy teams. We'll see how they want to platoon against him tonight. But uh, I think you can play the Cardinals again. And it's 80 degrees in, in St. Louis. So, yeah, give me that as opposed to Boston. Um, maybe some Corbin Burns, though, for sure. I think he's underpriced, definitely. Atlanta and Texas, uh, Strider and, and the Braves here almost exclusively. I'm, not, I'm just not going to deal with the Eovaldi. I, I think the performances over the last three games are too outsized to his career averages, and I think that's going to regress. Uh, and I'd like to go after him with a high upside offense. Um, Chicago and Houston, give me some offense here too. Maybe some JP France also, but I think the Cubs are playable because they're cheap. And Houston is also very cheap and playable in a very good spot against Drew Smiley. Cleveland and the White Sox again, just offense, I think down here. So I'm, I'm going to be pretty targeted here on the mound. It's going to be a lot of Chris Bassett, a lot of Cole, a lot of Strider for me. Um, I don't know who else I'm going to play. So, you know, maybe I just mix in a ton of teams and just lock those three guys in and just kind of see what happens. Maybe some JP France. I mean, I don't know. But um, that's uh, that's pretty much it for me, guys. Uh, once again, keep an eye out for projections updates. And also, if uh, as another reminder, we do have the uh, early slate vid posted in the Discord. Um, so go to the Premium MLB channel and look for that. So good luck tonight. Uh, on the early, on the main, whatever you're punting, uh, or in the betting markets for that matter. And we will catch you guys for Thursday.